Am I on stage? Are we on stage? We're on stage. We're on hey, stage. Ryan, how's, it, how's it going, Ryan? Is this a cold call? <laughs> let's let's actually start off, if we can, with a question for the audience. And you can type in your response into the QA section. And so the question that I want to ask you is this. Imagine for a second that you make a cold call and you open up the call with the line that you usually use when you open up a cold call. And the first words out of your prospect's mouth as soon as you get out your opening is this, can you send me an email? What I want you to do without even thinking about it is in the Q&A, type in what you would say. Don't think about it because pretend this is real time. Prospect picks up the phone. You say, hi, my name is Josh with Cognizant. How you feeling today? Or did I catch you at a bad time? Whatever your opening is, prospect says, can you send me an email? What do you say? I'm gonna go into the Q&A and see if we got any responses here. Sure, can I have your email? That's an interesting response, all right. When should I follow up on that? Is this what you typically say when you don't want people to chat? <laughs> and when can I call you back? Let's see what other kind of responses we're getting here. You're Come on, get people you engaged. Know I'm talking one, about. one minute in and we already got all of these comments, Josh. Absolutely can mind. Uh, okay, so here's here's um got some interesting answers there. Um, I actually asked this question on LinkedIn, uh, I don't know, Ryan, I think it was like six or seven months ago. We were kind of batting this around and we got about 421 comments and responses very similar to what we're seeing in the Q&A fell into two buckets. Um, we're going to call these the pressure and no pressure based bucket. Let me define these real quick. Uh, the the pressure based bucket is when the salesperson is trying to overcome this objection by saying something like this. Hey, I didn't even tell you why I'm calling. How could you not be interested? Or can I have 37 seconds to tell you why I'm calling? Or can you give me 15 minutes and just let me explain why I'm calling so I don't have to send you an email? Or the email comes with me. Can I talk to you for a second? The, the salesperson's trying to push for an agenda. That's the definition of a pressure-based response. And a no pressure-based response is when the salesperson doesn't have an agenda. They're not trying to push for a next step. So let me quiz you on this a little bit in the q and I'm going to share, share with you a response from a salesperson, one of them that was in the comments, and you tell me in the Q&A if you think it's a pressure-based response or no pressure. So here's the first one. Oh, and because my slides can't build, that's a downside to this software. I'm kind of giving it away a little bit. Um, so this is a, this is a pressure-based response. Normally, if I was using Keynote, you wouldn't see the answer here. So Here's a, here's a sales rep's response. Uh, great, let's set 15 minutes aside where we can discuss everything you'd like me to include in your email. That's a pressure-based response because the rep is asking for a next step. Here's another example of a pressure-based response. I can absolutely send you over an email, but it's a lot like reading IKEA instructions. It's hard to understand and take it in. The tell here that tips prospects off that they're being pressured is phraseology like this. Let's set up some time. I would love to. I can absolutely. How's 2 p.m. look? This is phraseology that when it comes out of a salesperson's mouth creates resistance because the prospect can feel the pressure. Here's another one. Sounds like this. I'd love to, but the best way I can do that is to present our data via a 10 minute phone call. So again, the tell or the language that tips the prospect off that they're about to be talked into something is the phrase, I'd love to. And the phrase, would tomorrow at noon work? Of course the salesperson would love to. They have commission breath, right? Here's another one that's no pressure. So prospect says, can you send me an email? And this is what Ryan might say in a very calm voice. Would it make sense for me to tell you the reason why I'm calling first? And then you can tell me if it makes sense to send an email. The reason this is different is that you're giving the prospect the freedom to choose. And it turns out that when you give people the freedom to choose and you're not forcing something down their throat, 
they're more likely to lean back and not feel the resistance. It's when you take people's freedom to choose away by saying, I'd love to meet, how's Friday at five, that people feel the pressure. So that's a non-pressure based response. If you had to take a guess as to the percentage of responses that were pressure based from salespeople versus no pressure, what percentage of responses do you think were pressure based? Type it into the Q&A. Do you think it's 80% pressure, 20% no pressure? You think it's 60, 40? Take a guess, pressure-based responses versus no pressure. Let's see what people think in the q and so if anybody can come close here. Let's Some see. high pressure, high pressure. 75 pressure. Oh, someone's at Tom's at 95 pressure, 60, 40, 60, 40. Let's 60. see here how close you guys were. Um, My slides are not building here in this software, unfortunately, but it's it's 91 to 9%. 91 to 9% pressure versus non-pressure. We take a look at this. The question becomes, what's causing the pressure? Why are so many salespeople pressuring prospects into taking a next step? Let's ask that question in the Q&A. See if anyone gets this one. It might seem blatantly obvious. Why are salespeople trying to persuade and push? Pressure creates diamonds, right? <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Anybody else? What else are we getting in there? Behind target. Yeah. Income. 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 Yeah. I mean, it's, it's quota, right? It's this idea that we are paid to get deals to move forward. We have obviously commission breath. We don't get paid until we book a meeting or until someone moves toward a close. The, the problem, of course, is that the selling process is a straight line. We're trying to get people from A to B as fast as possible. But buyers aren't on a straight line, especially with regards to outbound. They're not even thinking about it when we call them. They're getting the job done and they're making progress. And it's this pressure of moving faster than the prospect wants to move that creates the resistance. When a salesperson is moving faster and a prospect wants to move, it's kind of like saying to someone that you just met, can I meet your parents? It's a little bit fast. It's a little bit too much pressure. I'll actually prove it to you right now in this session. Imagine for a second that you're in the mall and you're walking by and someone says to you, can I ask you a question? That's in a mall kiosk. If you're like most people, what you do is you pretend you're getting a phone call or you pick up the pace because you're afraid of what happens if you answer that question. If you answer that question, you know you're gonna get sold some C scrub that you probably don't want because you are in the zone of resistance. The zone of resistance is a natural reflex reaction to sales pressure. And yet we're told to talk people into things all the time. In fact, most of the books we read are on persuasion. There's certainly a time and a place for persuasion, but it's certainly not at the beginning of a cold call because people are in their zone of resistance. So the job of you is not to persuade or talk people into things, is to lower the zone of resistance. The red, yellow, and green circles that people naturally have around themselves to protect themselves against self-serving salespeople. This is typical phraseology that creates resistance on a cold call. And this is some stuff that perhaps you've been taught. You pick up a phone and you say, the reason for my call is X. That, that's a tip off because the prospect can feel the windup of the pitcher on the mound and the fastball is about to come. The, the purpose of my call is to get on your calendar. I think I can save you a lot of money on payroll costs. I would love to. These phrases that salespeople say create resistance. I'll prove it to you some more. These are real cold calls that I've had transcribed when prospects have raised an objection, either on discovery calls or cold calls. Prospect says your price is too high and the salesperson thinks it's their job to defend their price like a mother bear defends its young and says something like this. Most people felt the same way, but what they found was this. Maybe you've heard this before. Feel felt found. Mm -hmm. I'm never in the history of listening to thousands of cold calls. Have I ever heard a prospect say, you know what? You're right. Your price isn't too high. 
after a person said this because they can feel the push. Whenever you try to talk people into things, they dig their heels in even deeper. You tell a teenager to stop smoking because it's unhealthy and they smoke even more. They go into resistance. You say something like, prospect says we have a vendor and you think it's your job to overcome that. So you say something like this, I just want to show you. There's again, there's the tip off. Of course you just want to show me you want to sell. Many customers were using a vendor when I reached out, but what they found was this, are you available Tuesday at three or four? They may agree to that, but then they're not going to show up because it's pressure, right? Or you may have heard an objection like this. Uh, send me an email, which we just talked about. Um, this is something that I heard on a real cold call that the rep was trained to do. They have a, a rebuttal a deck of rebuttals that they're supposed to do. And they said, the email comes with me. I just want to. There again, there's the phrase, right? I just want to. I call it a case of the I just want to. Again, creating, creates pressure um, all the time. Fighting resistance when prospects push back creates more resistance. If I told Ryan to stop having so much sugar and to stop eating cookies, and I started to talk him into all the reasons why cookies were bad. And I gave him my reasons and I started to explain to him why he was wrong about eating sugar. What that subconsciously says to Ryan is, I'm right and you're wrong. When you're explaining and you're lecturing and you're persuading and you're convincing, what you're really saying is, I'm right and you're wrong. And egos don't like that very much. So when your intent on a cold call is to persuade and talk everybody into things, you end up sounding in ways like the mall kiosk person. When your thought is, I got to talk everybody into a meeting, you behave in ways that sound pushy. And therefore, you get similar results and you feel the same way at the end of the call. So what Ryan and I want to talk to you about today is a way out of this, but it's going to require a little shift. And the way out of it is going to teach you how to lower the zone of resistance, not persuade. We, we can't persuade anyone that's in the zone of resistance. So the first thing we have to do is we have to lower the zone of resistance so that people feel comfortable telling us the truth. And Ryan's really good at this. And we're going to be listening to some calls in a second. The truth isn't always that they want to have a meeting with you. The truth is one of two things. Yes, this sounds interesting. And I'd like to continue learning a little bit more. Or no, I don't at this time. You get into trouble when you assume that everybody's a fit for what it is that you're selling. By way of example, Ryan and I made some calls last week. And although Ryan had a good list, he called the prospect and he was selling Cognizant, which requires an outbound sales team. And the call that we're going to listen to in a second, this guy doesn't have an outbound sales team. So it's not a fit. It's not Ryan's job to talk people into things. And you're going to hear this call in a second. You're going to hear Ryan sort of learn that this wasn't a fit despite his hypothesis and he's going to gracefully bow out of the call because his intent is to discover not to persuade and discovering means does this person have a potential problem or not rather than assuming when you assume everyone has the problem you pitch and persuade and overcome when you discover you lower the zone of resistance because you're not coming in with any assumptions it's a very different mindset it's almost like you're having a mini discovery call rather than a pitch. So you're going to hear a talk track in a second, but this is the big idea. This is the big shift, shifting away from persuading and toward discovering. Question is, how do you do it? It actually starts with your intent because your thoughts affect what you say. Your thoughts, what you think affects what you say. If you go to work and think, this is a chore, you're going to be in a bad mood. If you go to work and think, this is a privilege, you're going to be in a great mood. If you go into a cold call and think, my job is to talk people into things, you're going to persuade and pitch and overcome. If your intent is to discover, you end up letting go of expectations. I don't know. I certainly have a hypothesis, and I certainly believe that what I do can help people, but I have no idea until I actually have a conversation with someone. So this idea of detaching from the outcome, meaning we're gonna let go of the meeting 
Your job isn't to persuade and book meetings. Your job is to discover the truth, which is, does this person have a problem that I could potentially help with? It's going to require a little bit of a new mantra, a little sales mantra to quiet your voice down. And it sounds like this. I'm going to reach out to some people that might look at that word right there. Not that have a problem because have a problem is assumptive. And when you're assumptive, when you say things like, would you like to talk at two or three, that assumes that the prospect wants to talk. And it's the assumptive language that creates the pressure, right? So the phraseology here, and Ryan and I are both phraseologists. We're always looking for language. And you're going to hear this on the cold calls in a second that lowers resistance. And might is one of those words. We don't know. We think we know, but we don't know. Some people will be open to talking and some won't. It's okay either way. And this is the phrase that I repeat to myself every time I pick up the phone. Um, I'm for some people but I'm not for everyone. That two millimeter mindset shift changes the game on a cold call. Because when you have a different intent, you actually say things that feel very different. You actually use language that lowers resistance. And here's what some of it sounds like. And you're gonna hear some more when we get into the talk tracks. Um, hey, Josh, uh, my name is Ryan and we've never spoken before. I know you're probably in the middle of something and you weren't expecting my call, but I was hoping you could help me out for a brief moment. Uh, sure, how can I help you? I'm not sure I'm even in the right place and I'm a little embarrassed to even be asking, but are you still the one handling the podcast editing over there? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm the one that handles that. See what we're doing here? We're gonna be discovering are we talking to the right person? And we're not gonna barge in on someone without asking for their permission to have a little conversation with them. And we're gonna use a very calm and humble tone. There's a big misconception about sales is that you have to be an extrovert and loud and sales and hypey. What I would suggest is unbridled enthusiasm raises the zone of resistance because you're associated with the salespeople that are hypey. So you're gonna hear when you hear Ryan's call in a second, a very different tonality, uh, calm and a little slower, more like a TED talk than a personal trainer or a CrossFit trainer. There's a shift here that I want you to consider that I'm suggesting. And the shift is switching from pitching to discovering. Here's what that might sound like if you're a triathlon coach calling Ryan, who's a triathlete. We're going to do a little role play here, and we're going to reinforce this a little bit later on in the presentation with a real call. But Ryan's going to be a triathlete, and I have no idea if he's even hasn't, has any races planned, and I'm going to be a triathlon coach. So I'm going to give him a call. He's going to pick up the phone, and you're going to hear what this sounds like. Uh, so Ryan, you're going to pick up and say hello. You got Ryan. <laughs> Hi, Ryan. Uh, my name is is Coach Josh. We've actually never spoken before. And I know I probably caught you in the middle of something, but I was hoping to speak with you briefly. Uh, do you have a quick sec? Sure. What's up? Thanks, Ryan. I'll be brief. So I'm working with a few athletes in the Boca Tribe group, and I came across your name and was wondering, do you have any races planned or are you sitting this season out? I'm thinking about a race this summer. Thinking about a race? Yeah, you know how things are going these days. So I want to pause for a second here. So what we're doing here at the very first 20 seconds of the phone call is we're going to, A, find out, is this person even the person doing this job? Because if Ryan said, I got injured and I'm not doing any races this season, that's a perfectly good outcome and therefore not going to probably be a fit for triathlon coaching right now. Right. And that's possible. I won't know till I actually call Ryan. So he's sitting out some season. I might ask him some questions about like, Hey Ryan, when you're training, are you using a coach right now? Are you using like a training program or are you just kind of doing your own thing? Just doing my own thing. Just doing your own thing. Like with a, with a program or are you just like winging it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I got a, I got a little bit of a program. 
some YouTube videos and stuff, but just doing my own thing. What's your, been your experience uh, doing your own thing? That sounds like you're a real, uh, you know, uh, dedicated person over there. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I feel like I'm doing the best I can, man. My numbers are getting up every, every, uh, every week. I feel like I'm setting some new PRs. Is that the right word? Yeah, that's the right word. Personal, personal records. Yeah. And, and I'm sure you've batted this around. It looks like you've been doing triathlons for about 10 years, but what's your take on, on using a coach to help you stay motivated? Have you kind of thought through that a little bit and decided not really, not really for you? Yeah, I haven't really thought about it. Okay, what do so you, you, what do, you what do, Josh? Do? What do you do, yeah, Josh? So you, can, you can see kind of what we're doing here is we're discovering a couple things. One, are you even doing triathlons? Do you still edit podcasts? Are you involved in this? Two, how are you doing this today? And then three, how are you thinking about it? And I'm going to peel the onion back a little bit. And then I'm going to ask a question to see what their take is on this other thing. Let me just burn this in one more time with another example. This is for a company called Captivate IQ. And then we'll do one for Cognizant, right? So Ryan's going to pick up again. Uh, Ryan, you're going to say hello. Hello, this is Ryan. Hey, Ryan, uh, this is Josh. We've never spoken before. And I know you weren't expecting my call, but I was hoping you could help me out for a moment. Sorry, who is this? My, this is Josh. I am calling with Captivate IQ. I know you're uh, probably in the middle of something, but I was hoping to speak with you briefly. Uh, do you got a sec? Yeah. What do you got, man? Sure. Th thanks so much. Uh, so Ryan, I came across your name because we're working with a couple of fintech companies. Mm. And I was wondering if you are still involved with running commission statements over there. It's a little hard to tell by looking at the org tree. No, I don't do commission statements. You don't do them. Oh, so is that handled by someone else over there? Well, I mean, we kind of, it's kind of handled by a couple different people. Okay. So pause for a second here. So no, notice here, if the person that I'm speaking with doesn't handle the thing, why would I go in and start talking about the thing? Right? So we got to find out if we're talking to the right person. And if not, I might say something like this, uh, Ryan, I, I know it's not your job to help salespeople who haven't done their homework. I'm a little embarrassed to even be asking, but would you be open to pointing me in the right direction? Yeah, no problem. You probably want to talk to Liam. And now I could basically, now I can, you know, use uh, Ryan as a name to, to try to get to uh, Liam here. But that's the idea here is I'm letting go of assumptions that I'm discovering, right? When you have a different intent, it changes the whole game, right? When my intent is to discover, you can hear the tonality is more relaxed. I'm just like, I have no idea. I'm kind of indifferent to the outcome. When your intent is to discover, you end up sounding completely different because you're not attached to the to the meeting. And therefore you have different results. People open up and have a conversation with you. And you also have different feelings when you make a cold call because you don't get that debilitating feeling of rejection um, that happens. Um, this next slide is gonna be a huge problem, I think. I didn't count on this when I was using this software. And this is gonna be ugly, I think. Yeah, uh, this is the downside of using this software I didn't think through because this software doesn't look like it builds my slides properly. So I'm gonna have to try to, um, work through this a little bit in a, in a, in a, I don't know if anyone backstage can help me with this at all, or I can just maybe wing it. I, I'll, I'll try to wing it. Is okay. There, so, is, there, is there an option to share your screen, Josh, versus use the slides? Like just share um, your... Let me see. Is there, I don't think there is in this software. I've never used this software before. Let me see. Um, is anybody backstage know the answer to that or should I just keep going? I don't know if anybody can even hear me back there. Try, all right. We'll try, I'm gonna, we'll try next time. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to keep, I'm going to, I'm going to try to, to replicate this the best I can um, so without building slides. So the way I like to think about this is when you make a cold call, you're walking through a neighborhood and there's a bunch of brownstones. If you've ever seen a brownstone in Chicago, these are like little townhouses and you've got steps that lead up to the door. And there's going to be four steps that lead up to the door and standing in front of these houses are going to be prospects. And we're going to walk up to a prospect and we're going to ask them some questions. And some prospects will invite us to go up to the next step and to the next step and to the next step. And some prospects won't for various reasons. So let's talk about each of these steps and then we'll go through some live cold calls as well. So first step is we're going to ask someone's permission to talk. Now, let me just explain to you the psychology of this. So you understand why we're doing what we're doing. The um, best way that I can describe this is, it was a really famous restaurant in Chicago way before all these reservation apps. And they had a huge problem. Uh, people were making reservations, but they were 
not showing up. So the restaurant was losing literally hundreds of thousands of dollars a year because they have empty, had empty tables. The owner had a great idea. He told the hostess who was taking the reservations to make a small change to her script. And this is what she said. She said, hey, Ryan, looks like your reservation's at 630. If for any reason you can't make it, will you let me know? And the patron said, of course. And because they committed to letting them know, they did. And they had far fewer empty tables. The psychology is when someone says they're going to do something, we have a strong desire to have our actions match what we said. Otherwise, it feels bad. It feels incongruent. And human beings want to stay in homeostasis. We want to stay congruent. If Ryan told me he would help me move at 7 o'clock and didn't show up until 8, he'd feel bad. What we're doing here is when we ask someone's permission to talk is we're letting them commit to something so that they'll at least hear us out for step two. We're giving them control. Remember, when we take people's freedom of choice away and we start barging in and vomiting, we're taking their control away because it's assumptive. The next thing we're going to do here is we're going to answer the number one question they have, which is, do I even know you? So we're going to say something like this. Hi, my name is Ryan. We've never spoken before. Okay, so I know I don't know you. And then we're going to say this. And I know you weren't expecting my call. Or I know I probably caught you in the middle of something. This is what Chris Voss of Never Split the Difference fame calls a label. We're labeling the negative emotion they're probably thinking. And then you're going to say, but I was wondering if you could help me out for a moment, a brief moment. The psychology here is twofold. One, when you ask people for help, we're biologically wired to give people help. It's just how we're wired. And we're also saying a brief moment so they know it won't take that long. So each of these words is architected again to lower the zone of resistance. Now, I'm going to role play something here with Ryan because um, tonality matters a bunch. And Ryan's one of the best in the game at having tonality that lowers the zone of resistance. So I'm going to do it incorrectly. And then you're going to hear Ryan do it correctly. And he might change the words a little bit because he's Ryan, but he'll, it'll be still kind of in the same bar. So I'm going to do it in, incorrectly. Uh, hey, Kim, my name is Ryan. We've never spoken before. And I know you weren't expecting my call, but I was wondering if you could help me out for a brief moment. You got a second? So that's like what I call uptone girl or uptone boy with that uptone and really fast. And when you talk fast and you sound like a CrossFit instructor, you raise the zone of resistance. So what you're going to hear Ryan do is a calm, slower TED Talk voice. I'm going to pick up. You're going to hear Ryan. Um, hi, this is, this is Josh. Hey, Josh. My name is Ryan. We've never spoken before. And I know you weren't expecting my call, but uh, I was wondering if you might be able to help me out for a moment. Yeah. Do you feel that? Do you feel that? How inviting that is? Uh, I have listened to lots of Ryan's calls and what you'll generally hear when you start to make that your own, again, we're not suggesting you use this word for word, but you get the idea of it is you'll invite people. They'll be like, uh, sure. Who are you with? What's this about? And now we've just gone to step two. So step two is we want to make sure we're actually talking to the right person. Um, Ryan, you came up with some really great phraseology on the last call, which was a little different than this that I like, where you were kind of saying, um, sometimes it's really hard to tell if I'm in the right place. But the idea here is that you want to be a little humble. When you're humble and you're a little vulnerable, you lower the zone of resistance. So that might sound like this. Uh, thanks, uh, Josh. I, I'm not sure I'm in the right place and I'm a little embarrassed to even be asking, but are you still working with the inside sales team, are you still managing the inside sales team over there? It was, it was kind of hard to tell by the org chart. All right, so you'll hear Ryan do this now. We're going to roll this from the beginning, from step one to step two, so you can hear how this flows together really nicely. And this is a script for, for Cognizant. So here's how that might sound from the beginning. I'm going to pick up the phone. Um, hi, this is Josh. Hey, Josh. Uh, my name is Ryan. We've never spoken before. And I know you weren't expecting my call, but I was wondering if you might be able to help me out for a brief moment. Uh, sure. How can I help you, Ryan? I appreciate it. Josh, Josh, I know uh, I'm not sure if this is exactly you. I'm a little embarrassed to actually be asking. I'm not sure if I'm in the right place or not. Sometimes it's hard to tell. But the, do you still manage the inside sales team over there? Do they report into you or are you managed directly with that team? Okay. So see what we're doing here is we're, we're, we're basically saying, hey, uh, are you the person that is 
the person doing this job that I potentially can help, right? Um, I, I did leave something out here. I, this is where I would where, would announce the name. Thanks. Uh, again, I'm with Cognizm. Um, I'm a little embarrassed to be asking, but I'm not sure I'm in the right place. Are, are you still working with the inside sales team? Are you still involved with them? And what you're going to hear on this cold call when you hear it in a second is the person saying, yeah, I manage the team. And now we've gone to the third step. And the third step, what we're going to do, and unfortunately, it's hard to see because of the way the uh, this software works, or my fault for not testing this out, is we're going to ask them how they are currently getting the job done today. So you'll notice in the triathlon example, I said to Ryan, hey, Ryan, when you're, when you're training for a triathlon, are you using a coach? Are you using a training program? Or are you just kind of winging it? With regards to Cognizant, what that might sound like is, you know, hey, Josh, um, how are you, if you don't mind me asking, if you don't mind me asking, that's another one of these great phrases I like, because again, it gives the prospect control. If you don't mind me asking, how are you currently going about getting contact data for your reps? Are you using like a Lucia, like a Zoom info? We're gonna understand how they're getting the job done today. So let's go, we're gonna rewind this from parts one, two, and three. So you can hear how this flows all together. What you're gonna hear is Ryan give a permission-based opener. In the second part, he's gonna say, thanks, I'm with Cognizant. He's going to see if he's in the right place. And then he's going to ask a question to see how they're currently getting the job done today. No matter what you sell, everybody's getting the job done today somehow without you. And so what I want to do is, hey, Josh, a lot of the tri you know, triathletes, uh, they're typically using you know, two or three methods to train with. They're training by themselves. they got a program or they're working with a coach. Um, how are you training for triathlons? So we're going to find out how they're getting the job done today. Again, it's like a little mini discovery call. When you're asking questions, brains have to pay attention. When you're lecturing, like what I'm doing now, brains can kind of zone out. So what we're doing here is we're having brains hold up their end of the bargain. And when you combine this with the right tonality, as you're going to hear on the cold call in a second, people just open up because there's no, there's no persuasion, there's no pitching, there's discovering. So here it is from the beginning. We're going to run it from step one to step three, nice and slow, so you can kind of hear the flow, and then we'll keep piling on steps. Um, hi, this is Josh. Josh, this is uh, Ryan. We've never spoken before. I know I'm probably catching you in the middle of something, but I was hoping you could help me out for a moment. Sure. How can I help you, Ryan? Uh, thanks, uh, Josh. Again, my name is Ryan with uh, Cognizant. Uh, we're working with several inside sales teams, and I came across your name. It's um, sometimes hard to tell where the inside sales team reports into. Uh, I'm a little embarrassed to be asking. Are you... Uh, you managing the inside sales reps or working directly with the inside sales team over there? Yeah, I manage I manage uh, all the reps over here. Oh, fantastic. Um, if you don't mind me asking, what are you guys using to find contact information today? Uh, are you using something like a, like a Zoom info or maybe like a Lucia or something? Okay, perfect. So listen, listen to the tonality and we're giving some different types of options, right? This is some, something else I want you to pay attention to. What are you using today? Using A or B? Notice how Ryan didn't just stop saying, didn't stop it. Like, what are you using today to find contact records? That's harder to answer than if you give people a little menu choice. Are you going to use an A or B or C? When you say A or B or C, it lowers resistance because it makes, it makes it easier to answer. The second thing that it does is it shows a little credibility because you probably know all the different ways that people doing this job are getting it done today. It's kind of a tell that you're an insider. So Josh, when you're training for a triathlon program, using like a training peaks, right? That's an insider training triathlon lingo. Using like a training peaks, a Strava, or a coach, or you kind of doing your own thing. That's gonna tip the prospect off that you're kind of an insider, right? Now, in this particular case, on this call that you're gonna hear, the prospect said this, we don't do any outbound. We're really blessed because we get a ton of inbound leads and enough to keep us going uh, and with referrals. So we don't actually even have an outbound team at all. Now, if you're cognizant, it's probably better to find people that actually have an outbound team than people that don't. Because if they don't have an outbound team, they probably don't need cognizant it would be easier to find people that at least have an outbound team. And this is an, a perfectly reasonable outcome of a call. So what Ryan's not going to do is push 
and persuade and try to talk him into having an outbound team. That's a heavy lift. Better to just find people that actually have an outbound team. Right? So if in fact he did have an outbound team or he said, hey, you know, we're using like Lucia, Ryan might say, oh, Lucia, I've heard some really great things about them. What's been your experience using Lucia? We're not going to overcome that. We're going to lean into that. What's been your experience with it? Oh, it's been uh, working out pretty well. Uh, pretty well? Yeah. Talk, 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 talk. And then Ryan might say this. What's your take on diamond records? Now, this is what Cognizant does. And we're using the word diamond records on purpose because the prospect probably has no idea what that is. And so what it's going to elicit is, well, what is that? And now the prospect is curious. Right? The prospect is now leaning forward. All right, so we're going to roll this back again, and we're going to go through the path of the prospect actually having one of these databases. You can see the flow, and then we're going to play the actual cold call of the prospect who actually didn't have an inside sales team. So you can kind of see how both of these work. So we're going to roll this back from the beginning, and you're going to see Ryan spending a little time in that poke step where he's kind of poking around to see if there's a potential problem. I'm going to say I'm using Lucia. He's, he might say something like, I got a lot of people using that thing. They love it. What's been your experience with it? We're going to validate their choice. We're going to make them feel good. We want to make the ego feel good. So here's what that might sound like from the beginning. We're going to roll this back so you can kind of hear the flow. So I'm going to pick up. Uh, hi, this is Josh. Hey, Josh. Uh, my name is Ryan. We've never spoken before, and I know I'm probably catching in the middle of something, but I was uh, hoping you might be able to help me out for a brief moment. Uh, sure. How can I help you? Uh, thanks. Uh, again, Josh, my name is Ryan. I'm, I'm with Cognizant. Um, we're working with several inside sales teams and I came across your name. It's uh, always hard to tell where the inside sales function reports into. I'm a little embarrassed to be asking. Uh, are you uh, managing the reps directly over there? Are you working closely with the inside sales team? That's me. I'm managing those little rap scallions. Oh, rap scallions. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, Sound like a great person to work for. Uh, <laughs> if you don't mind me asking, Josh, uh, are you guys, what are you guys using to find contact information over there today? Are you using something like Zoom Info or uh, Lucia, something like that? Yeah, we're using, uh, we're using Zoom Info. We've been using that for about three years now with our team. Oh, that's fantastic. You know, since they've gone public, I feel like they're really doing some amazing things over there. Lots of folks seem to be using Zoom Info. Just, just out of curiosity, uh, How's that going? How are you guys liking Zoom Info? See what you're doing here is kind of leaning into it, right? And I might, I might be talking, yeah, ba 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 ba, and then he's gonna now say, "What's your take on Zoom or on Diamond Records?" Here's what's coming. Yeah, so we've been using it. We we kind of like it a lot. I mean, our reps seem to like it. They seem to be getting, you know, quite a quite a good uh, number of connects with it. And there's a lot of good mobile numbers in there. We've been uh, we've been pretty happy with it. Oh, that's great. Uh, what's your take on Diamond Records? What's a diamond record? Now, listen to how Ryan's going to explain this. Um, diamond record or like uh, even what he does. Listen to how he's going to explain what he does, but not from the perspective of what it does, but he's going to start with the problem. And he's going to use a phrase like this. It's going to start like this. Hey, Josh, you know how? So listen to how masterful this is in lowering the zone of resistance. So I'm sorry, what's, what's a diamond record? Josh, you know how your reps are using the Zoom Info data, they pull a great list, they make about, I don't know, 50 dials, and they might talk to one or maybe two people. Uh, with Diamond Records, uh, they have eight to 12 conversations in that same 50 dials. How, how, does, that, how does that work? And see what we're doing here, we're kind of peaking a little curiosity. We're not explaining the how. Because if the prospect says, well, how does it work? Or you know, what, what's going on there? You might then go to the last question, which is going to pop the question and said, hey, I, I know I'm kind of catching you off guard here. I'd be happy to tell you, but I know you're probably in the middle of something. You know, Would it make sense to carve out some time or can I send you a video so you can see if this is something you want to explore? As soon as the prospect starts to be a little curious, we can now start to maybe go for the traditional sort of ask. But what you'll find a lot of times is the prospect wants to know right there on the call. And I've listened to a lot of Ryan's calls that go 30, 45 minutes because people have felt understood first. And when you make people feel understood, they're more open to wanting to talk. When you lecture at people in the beginning, they want off the phone. So what I want to do now is I want to play you the real call 
Um, it's only about a minute and a half. I edited it a little bit for this broadcast. But what you're going to hear is the most important thing, which is the in Ryan's intent. You're going to hear this prospect say, we don't have an outbound team. And you're going to hear Ryan do something that I never hear reps do, which is to stop persuading and get off the phone because it's not a fit. And so much cold calling is everyone thinks they're a fit with everyone. So here's the call. I'm going to go play it right now. I can figure this out. So I'm going to go to media. No, I'm going to go to videos. Okay. And then here's the call right here. Says it, is it working? Can people hear it? Outlet, this is Anthony. Oh, hey, Anthony. Uh, this is Ryan. You and I actually haven't spoken before. And I know I'm probably catching you in the middle of something. Uh, but I was hoping I might see if you could help me out for a moment. Okay, what you got? Yeah, sure. I'm calling with Cognizant, and we're working with several uh, inside sales teams, and I came across your name. It's always hard to tell whether or not, like, a head of sales is managing inside sales function or not. Are you managing an inside sales rep over there or uh, working with an inside sales team directly? Uh, no, I am the sales manager, yes. Oh, perfect. So, hey, if, if you don't mind me asking. What are you guys using to find uh, contact information today? Are you guys uh, using something like a Zoom Info or a Lucia? Nothing. We actually, leads come to us. We don't have to generate any of that, so it's really nice. Sounds like you guys are uh, building an engine over there. Uh, yeah, we have uh, one of the few businesses that we do not go out, and now we have an email database from people who've come into our store over the years. Uh, but outside of that, we are a referral business, and... Uh, and uh, just kind of well-known in our town. I appreciate your time. All right. Thank you. All right. Have a good day. sort of detached from the outcome in a sense, just like sort of oh. discovering if it's a fit versus assuming it's a fit. Oh, Ryan, can you hear me? I think I just came back in. You kept me backstage oh, or something. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. So, so what I was, I was asking Ryan, how, the, how those calls feel when you're sort of in this discovering mode versus pitch mode. Cause I know it's a little bit of a different, a different perspective. Yeah. It's the, the interesting part about the uh, framework here is that we're really trying to gather information and not go in for the appointment. And, uh, and again, it's a cold call. So not everybody is going to be open to giving you all the information up front. So you've got to be able to navigate that conversation in a way where, you know, you're feeling like you're getting what you need out of the conversation, but also not putting too much pressure. Um, I felt like the, the lab that we ran here, the conversations we were having, um, it took a couple to get going, but it felt really natural. Uh, and once we got past that, that first part of that phraseology, you know, adding in some of those words around uh, being a little bit embarrassed, uh, also uh, letting them know like, hey, we're, we're, we're not exactly sure before we assume. A lot of times in our pitches, we assume, hey, you're ahead of sales, you must think about this stuff it really felt like a different level of a conversation, conversation being activated. Um, and that last one that you, you know, you definitely cut out a bunch in there. I think it was probably like a nine minute call. We, we did some more discovery in the middle. It wasn't like, oh, we, we're not good. We went out, but it was, you know, the, the gist of that was there. And I got a really solid understanding that they're not going to be a fit for something like what we do. And we just got out of there. I didn't need to ask if 
hey, by the way, in case things change, maybe if you'd like, you can see right. some, just like, hey, that's great. You know, keep me posted. You know, we that's the difference in that conversation. It was a discovery. It was a mini discovery. It's like you're probably not a fit. Even if I did set that guy was a nice, nice gentleman. Um, I might, maybe could have persuaded him to take 10, 15 minutes to book the meeting. Maybe. But I didn't care. Right. I got the information I need and I'm looking at trying to move on to that next conversation uh, with somebody who might have that um, a better fit for what we're trying to accomplish here, uh, which is truly, that. truly focused on, you know, finding folks who are, are trying to build these this outbound sales development mo motion. I love that. Something else I want to point out that Ryan does um, exceptionally well is when prospects push back a little bit. So what you what you're not going to hear too much with this talk track is we're using another vendor because we're not lending itself to that, right? We're kind of calling that out at the beginning, you know, are using yes. A and B and C. So no, someone's going to not say we're using a vendor for that because we we've actually constructed the cold call track to not have that happen. Um, but if you're using a traditional cold call track and you vomit your value proposition, I can help you save money on your taxes. I can help you save money on your accounting. I can help you get uh, employee retention credits. What you're typically going to hear is I've got someone for that because surprise, surprise, that's not an objection. That's actually true. Mm -hmm. Everybody that you reach out to has someone that they're using to get the job done today. They're figuring it out. They're making progress. In order for you to get their attention, you have to know something they don't know that they haven't heard of before that can hurt them. I want to say that one more time because it bears repeating. When you hear, I've got something for that, what's really happening is your prospect doesn't perceive you as being meaningfully different. So to frame this up, let me explain to you this call that we're going to listen to that Ryan did. Um, Ryan is representing an accounting firm that specializes in employee tax credits. For those that are unaware, these are tax credits that are issued to small businesses, sometimes in the area between 20 and $21,000 a year uh, per employee. And most companies have looked into this already with their general accounting firm. The problem is general accounting firms are general. They do lots of things and they're not really deep into the employee tax credit thing. And because of that, they're not exactly aware of the different ways in which that money could be obtained through no fault of their own. They're just generalists. When you're a specialist, sometimes you can uncover that money. That's the unique idea that Ryan's bringing to the table. So you have to have, what is it that you know that your prospect doesn't know? And then you have to use very subtle language to start to make the prospect scratch their head and think, hmm, I'm not sure, what are you talking about? So what we're gonna hear now is a call where the prospect said, I have someone for that. And Ryan's going to say one of his favorite phrases, which is, that's exactly why I'm calling. Not, well, a lot of people who are using accountants found us. And then what they thought after that was this, that's going to, that's overcoming the objection. What Ryan's going to do is he's going to ask a question to get the prospect to think a little differently. And you're going to hear the prospect leaning forward. So I'm going to play that call for you right now. And here we go. Uh, yeah, yeah. Our, our, we have a CPA, an outside CPA firm that handles our taxes and all that, and um, we are they're handling that for us, but thank you. Yeah, Sandy, that, that's why we're reaching out. General accounting firms, uh, you know, they, they definitely might have you in, in great shape, but we're just uh, available to help with some of the potential questions around compliance and uh, just so making sure you have all your I's dotted, your T's crossed. Mm -hmm. We're finding is that uh, our clients who generally have the taxes and all that stuff they take care of are finding that there's just a lot of question marks around if you're to take this uh, credit, uh, you know, will you be on the hook for it in the future? You know, we've got a fairly straightforward uh, conversation to have to see if we can or cannot help. And uh, 
if uh, if you're in good shape, we'll let you know. But if not, we um, we can help you out. And we're not looking to take on your CPA business. We're just looking to see if this is something we can be supportive with. Um, so, um, I, I, you know, I, I've uh, had numerous conversations with our CPA regarding the ERC, and he says we're not eligible. Um, so I don't right. know. Is that what's something you're trying to find out whether we are or aren't, or what? It, that's that's exactly right. So if your CPA said no, maybe there's still a chance. We find that some people don't quite understand the full qualification criteria and could be missing out on the tax credit. Uh -huh. um, so the conversations around one, making sure you know, if you're not qualified, let we'll you know quickly. But if you are, two, um, you know, making sure that you have all your uh, compliance pieces in place so that if you do take take advantage of it. You don't have yeah. to worry about audits in the future. Okay. Um, and so it's just a it's a very, very brief introductory conversation with one of our experts. Um, and again, not, not looking to take your time right now, but see if you'd be open to that conversation at some point in the next week or two. Sure. What is the deadline, isn't it, for that? I mean... Uh, yeah, it's, it's right around the corner here. I think it's the first of the, the first part of the year. Um, so we're uh, we're looking at um, a pretty tight window here to see if we can be helpful. Um, do, do you happen to have uh, maybe 10, 15 minutes next Tuesday or Wednesday afternoon? Um, let me see. Tuesday afternoon or Wednesday. we go back Ryan oh, I'm back again okay. I'm back. The idea that we're, we're not replacing we're sort of augmenting and that's another way to lower the zone of resistance right instead of ripping out and replacing we're supplementing the other phrase that you heard Ryan do is I'm not sure if it is or isn't and again when you're non-assumptive you lower the zone of resistance and you heard the prospects of leaning forward I'm gonna play another call for you same kind of idea where the prospect is already doing something, and you're gonna hear Ryan use some phraseology that's gonna make the prospect think, well, hmm, I'm not sure. Same exact idea. You have to have a point of view, a perspective, something you know that they don't know. So here's the next call. See if you can spot it out. It's loading up right now. And it was a little bit more of an in-depth, and that was an engagement that we went into where I think they get, I think whatever they get for us, they get 25%. Oh, wow. Um, has, that's, that's quite a bit. Uh, sounds like maybe the second party that you're working with does some similar stuff that we do, but um, our fees are not that high. How, um, how high are your fees? Um, I'm not, it's a little bit above, above my pay grade, but it's not, definitely not 25%. Um, mm -hmm. I want to say I want to say it's 10%. Mm -hmm. The other piece here is what we're hearing from most folks is this compliance side is a little bit uh, wishy-washy. It seems to be changing like every week. Uh, so. We're setting up these introduction calls, uh, 10, 15 minutes, just to get a better lay of the land for you. And if you're if you're open, just another opinion, um, dot your I's, cross your T's. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that's worth 10, 15 minutes of your time just to see how we compare to what you're yeah. getting. But Sure, uh, I'm traveling next week, though, so the week after would have to be when I do it.
what you're kind of hearing here is like no hand-to-hand -hand combat, right? A, a second opinion. And you'll notice the real shift there was when Ryan said, wow. Like that phrase right there made the prospect subconsciously think, what do you know that I don't know? Because nobody wants to overpay. And you heard the prospect saying, what do you have? And then Ryan said, I think it's around. I think it's around. Again, that language is very, you know, non-pressury. It's around 10%. And it's the contrast of 25 to 10% that's going to make the prospect sort of lean forward, right? And then Ryan said to get a second opinion, to see kind of what's out there. Subconsciously says to the prospect, there's no pressure here. What you're really hearing here is, is verbal Aikido. Right? We're not moving against the resistance. We're joining the resistance. So what I'd like to do now with uh, the time that we have left, we have about seven minutes or so, is we'll open it up for some Q&A. Um, if anyone has any questions for Ryan or myself, um, or Ryan, if you want to add any color, we can do that um, at this time. I'll, I'll pop into the Q&A as well. Yeah, so Josh, obviously, as always, your perspective on this stuff is, is so enlightening. And what I love about working with you is we're always trying new things. And the point that we're trying to get across here is that the objective, the intent, as you said, of cold calling doesn't always have to be, I got you on the phone, let's get you into my calendar. Uh, there's another way to think about using the phone to build awareness, gather information. And this mini discovery framework, I do believe will help folks uh, lower that zone of resistance and get into more conversations. And the phraseology we were using uh, from the calls we did on the lab on Friday, I know we shared one today uh, as an example here, uh, you can see in the, the conversations that are happening, this shift uh, in the information gathering stage. And because of that, we're actually able to have an idea of, are we targeting the right people? Are we saying the right things? And those are the things that are so important at the very top of the funnel. Uh, so I just want to layer that in because it's just really fun to try new things out. And, um, and I think that uh, what we shared today is something that if you put into action, you'll find yourself in more meaningful sales conversations and less getting shut down uh, right out the gate. So um, I don't know if we have any. Yeah, one of the questions someone had is, what, what do I do when I'm working in a, in a space that's commoditized? Um, here's the yeah. thing. Um, if you don't have anything that's meaningfully different, there's no reason for the prospect to want to have a conversation with you. Mm -hmm. Right. So you have to be able to find what is that, what is that idea that you have that they don't know about that can hurt them? Um, I'll, I'll just tell you a, a, a super quick two minute story on this that drives this home. Sneakers are one of the most commoditized things there are. Like everyone's got sneakers and there's a thousand sneakers out there. Um, one day I was with my wife in the mall and I didn't need anything. I was just there keeping her company. We were going to grab some dinner afterwards. And I walked into a fit to run store, not needing anything. If the sales associate said, we got new sneakers, they're faster, stronger, better, quicker. I'm going to be like, dude, I got, I got sneakers. I'm good. That's a very commoditized way to sell. If she said, we're running some specials on sneakers, I'm not going to, I'm not interested, but she didn't do that. She looked down at my sneakers. She said, are you a runner? I said, yes. She said, what distance? I said, I'm training for my first marathon. And she said, have you ever had a running gate test? And I said, what's that? Moments later, I'm on a treadmill in the store. She freezes the frame and shows me that my ankles are overpronating. And she said, the problem is, if you run in sneakers that are not made for pronated feet, you can get injured on long distance runs. Yep. And if you'd like, I could take a look at your sneakers to see if they're made for pronated feet. And I ended up buying some new sneakers and insoles. The idea there is her perspective was, if you're doing marathons and if you have pronated feet, this is something that can hurt you if you don't know about it, right? Kinestra, like P90X is probably the best example of this that I can even think of. You know, everyone was working out until Tony Horton said, the problem with traditional workouts is you plateau. You do the same exercises over and over again. What you need is muscle confusion, right? So you have, what's your muscle confusion? If you don't, if you're selling just another workout program, no one's going to care because I got a workout program. You need that unique mechanism, as Eugene Schwartz calls it, the muscle confusion, the pronated well, we feet. As, as Ryan said, the, oh, wow, you're paying 25%? Wow. That's going to immediately cause someone to say, well, um, what, am I overpaying? I, I think so. We're, we're seeing like 10%. Well, 
Well, sure, I'd we, like to learn about that. We covered we covered this in the phraseology for the Cognizant script, right? Somebody who manages an inside sales outbound team today uh, likely has contact data vendor. If they don't, well, we just found ourselves a unicorn. But uh, if you have reps responsible for outbound today, you likely have a data vendor. So you 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 actually start the conversation with calling it out. If you're in a commoditized environment, talk it up. Hey, you know, are you using stuff like X, Y, and Z, A, B, and C? Um, and and you're you're already getting them to say, yeah, probably one of those or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, fantastic. Now you can transition into like we did today. Well, what do you what do you think about this? And Josh's version, have you had a running gate test? You already have a shoe. Have you had a running gate test? Have and, and this other version. Um, what are you doing about muscle confusion? What is your why? What is your differentiator? And if you're not yeah. differentiated, then, I mean, it's going to be very difficult to be successful in outbound. Like you can't just be a me too product and be successful in outbound. No one gives a crap about your product or service. They care about a problem that they may or may not understand, an opportunity they're missing, a threat they're not seeing. Those are the things that are going to start conversations. And how can you become that? conversation starter with this differentiated problem statement question however you want to look at it that's how i think about getting into that because most of us are in a, even if it, you don't think it's commoditized as, as josh said everyone's getting the job done right now if you're going outbound everyone's getting the job done even if you don't think you have a competitor they're doing something uh so you still have to have that mindset when you're when you're making that call i love that we'll just end with one question from dylan and uh, maybe we can both chime in on this one. So Dylan says, um, any advice for how you'd handle this at a B2B data consulting firm? For example, most teams have their own internal data team, but not the right people, process, and tech to scale. So here's the thing, Dylan. Um, you're talking about what you do. When someone doesn't have the right process and the data team, what terrible thing happens after that? So what you're talking about there in your message is, you think that's a differentiator, but having a, a, a the right people in process and tech, that doesn't solve a problem. That's a means to an end. So what I want to know for you is when someone's using their current solution, they have an internal data team. If they keep using their internal data team, what specifically can go wrong? And when I mean specifically, I mean, you have to see the black and white version of the infomercial in your head. You got to see the person cutting the tomato with a dull knife. If you've ever seen the Ginsu commercial. And when you cut a tomato with a dull knife and you're wearing a white shirt and you watch that infomercial, what you see is the tomato splatting on the white shirt. That's a very visceral reaction. That's not right people process and tech. And so what you have to get to is the black and white version of the infomercial. You got to feel that first. And based on this message that I'm seeing from you, maybe you have some work to do on that because until you can see that black and white tomato splat, it's going to be really tough to start to develop the phraseology. I don't know, Ryan, what's your take? It's a, it's the same, same thing we just talked about, right? Okay. There's a, there's a today and there's a tomorrow. Everybody has the job to be done. Like you said, I, I love your visual of the black and white infomercial. It just, if you don't know, if you don't know what he's talking about, go, go look at the blue blockers commercial. Yeah. Those are the best blue blockers <laughs> blind, right? Like go, go, Joe find Sugarman, some of those Joe old, Sugarman. <laughs> go find some of those old <laughs> commercials and you'll, you'll start to visualize how you can think about the world today for your prospects and whether you sell software or services, it doesn't matter. People do not care about those things that you do. They care about their current state, their situation. And again, are you going to make it better? Are you going to give them a more opportunity? Are you going to reduce some sort of threat? And how can you position that in a way that helps them see the light, right? And you know, we use the one today. Hey, great, that's fantastic. Zoom Info, one of the best tools, they're public, everyone's using them. But hey, just out of curiosity, what do you think about diamond records, <laughs> right? Well, it's diamond records. Well, you know how when you buy Zoom Info data, your reps are still having to make 25, 50 dials just to get somebody on the phone. Yeah, I do, right? And in this great resignation, it seems like people are leaving jobs left and right. So you finally get them on the phone and they just left yesterday. <laughs> well, with Diamond Verified Records, your reps have eight to 12 conversations for every 50 dials. 
Yeah, black, and, white. And then you could say, black, black, yeah, and then, white. And then you could, yeah. and then you could say right after that, and, and and you could say right after that, you could say this. And if you'd like, I can send you a video. Yes. Where you could see some more detail on this, and you can decide if you'd like to learn more. Right. Rather than you don't have to ask for the meeting every time. You can sort of plant a seed there. And yeah, what you'll find that. when you kind of pull back like that is you'll get a lot more people to say, sure, I'd be open to that because it's a lower commitment ask on a first conversation, right? And then that's going to make a, a follow-up if they're interested much easier. You can play the longer game. I know, Ryan, you're big on that. Well, we, we missed that. And I wanted to call it out. The call to action today too wasn't in the in the end of the recording, but we actually we actually moved away from saying, oh, and by the way, would you like to set up a time to see this live? Yeah. It's like, you know, you know what? I promised I was going to be brief. And in, in, in this case, it was Friday, right? It's kind of late on a Friday. It, would it be okay if I just shoot a little video, uh, send it over via email? And if you decide it's worth exploring, we can set something up next week. Done. I'm out. I'm out of your hair. I just left you with a ton of intrigue. And if I fire off that video with a little bit of personalization, which takes, you know, 60 seconds, go to their website, go to LinkedIn profile, record a little video and then have some canned, you know, beautiful marketing collateral uh, behind it if you have it and you're done, right? If there is a fit, there's a fit and you probably saved yourself 10, 15 minutes if there wasn't. I love that. I was on a call, uh, listened to a call last week with Captivate IQ and the rep said, um, what's your thoughts on automating commission payouts? And the prospect unloaded. It won't work because of A and B and C and D. We've got so many complex rules here that there's no way it could be automated. And the rep said this, I know it's late and you weren't expecting my call. If you're open to it, I can send you a video on how we address those exact issues. So you can decide if you wanna learn more. How's that sound? And the, and the prospect was like, sure, I'll take a look, right? And because he sort of committed to it and there wasn't a, let's get a meeting real quick, let me meet the parents. Um, he played the long game and eventually converted that into a conversation. Now it's an opportunity, right? So you're not assuming that the prospect might have heard of your solution, right? This prospect has not ever considered automating payouts. I'm sure they've looked into it. So rather than them launching into what we do at Captivate IQ, the question was, what's your take? What's your thoughts on, um, I'm sure you've gone down this path on automating payouts. You're kind of using spreadsheets right now. Yeah, dude, we looked into that five times and we've got all these complex rules. Rather than pitching him, he's like, hey, those are exactly the kind of things we address. Um, I know I'm catching you real late in the day. And just like Ryan said, I'm going to shoot you. If you're open to it, I could send you a video. You could check it out and see if it looks interesting. Uh, sure, I'll take a look. Great, what's your email address? That's a perfectly positive phone call, even though it quote unquote didn't book a meeting. I love that insight, Ryan. That's great. Well, and the data behind this, by the way, I started running this a couple of weeks ago when we started talking about this session. I've got two active campaigns running right now where this is the thing we do. We call... We don't ask the meeting, we send it over. And I'm looking at the emails uh, that have been accepted. And out of all the emails that are sent in both of these accounts, there's only one that hasn't been opened. <laughs> and some of them, I'm looking through it, it's like five open, six open, seven opens, right? So the other thing that people probably don't understand is that when you get somebody on the phone, they tend to pick up the phone again and again and again. So if you leave them with something uh, different than what other reps do. You're not putting that pressure to push this next step. You give them an opportunity to learn on their own terms. And of course you're blessed with the right resources to kind of take advantage of the fact that content can keep that conversation going when you're not, you're going to save yourself a ton of time, a ton of headache. And when you follow up, you're going to get even deeper into that conversation. They're going to be even more forthcoming with the information that you're trying to capture. Again, are they, these the right people? Do they really have a pain right now that you can solve? And is there an opportunity to help them right now or not? Um, and that's what I really like about this, uh, this process, Josh. I think it's, it, if, if, if folks try this and they, they do that compound conversation, uh, not only is it going to feel better on your soul, you're going to have a better uh, experience with your customer. And having that customer uh, journey in mind, you're going to start to build long-term, sustainable, repeatable pipeline. Because those who may or may not have been on the fence that you pushed today, they're going to be around, to, around tomorrow with a better taste in their mouth when you reach out and, and connect. With I love them. that, Ryan. And now uh, we got 15 seconds here. We're counting down. Hopefully this was helpful for everybody. If you have any questions for Ryan, he's on LinkedIn at Ryan Reisert. And if you have any questions for me, I'll just point you to Ryan. So just reach out to Ryan, <laughs> Ryan Reisert. <laughs>
All right, everybody. Thanks for joining. Thanks, Ryan. It was always nice collaborating with you, my friend. You too. Take care.